make a motion to approve the agenda by Mr. Forsyth, seconded by Mr. Reagan. Any discussion on it? Does anybody have any questions? All in favor? Aye. Next, we need an approval of the minutes by Mr. Reagan, seconded by Mr. Sheridan. Any corrections to those? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So, secondly, we go on to centralized biosolid management. That would be Yes, Karen Richards. Okay. Hi. 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 Hi everyone, I'm Darren Richards from uh, the town of Colton. I'm the DPW superintendent. Thanks for all. Thanks first of all for serving all your constituents in St. Louis County and especially on such a uh, sunny day. I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Uh, I first came up with this problem uh, 10, 10 years ago when I saw the escalation of uh, sludge uh, continue to rise and rise at our wastewater treatment plant five or six years ago. I met with uh, some vendors at a uh, wastewater treatment um, uh, conference and they had some solutions. And this, these solutions are drying beds that came into fruition and uh, they're being built all over uh, upstate New York. We started at 14 cents a gallon, um, removing our sludge from our wastewater treatment plant. And this year, uh, that was approximately 10,000 Five hundred dollars uh, this year. We reached uh, this last year. We reached thirty-one thousand. So if you can imagine, everybody's in up uproars of eight percent inflation. That's a two hundred percent inflation in, in the course of ten years. Um, if you look at twenty thousand dollar increase in the course of ten years, and we could solve that by bringing it back down to two thousand eleven prices, and we could do it at twenty thousand dollars savings per year at our plant. Uh, 20 wastewater treatment plants in St. Louis County would be about $400,000 a year times 10 years, that's uh, 4 million times 20 years, that's 8 million. That's just for our plant, though. Those are our prices, and we are the smallest. So the cost exponentially is a lot higher for Governor, Canton, uh, Potsdam, Ogdensburg, Messina. Um, so let me let me uh, go back. And this. So this is why I got into it. I asked Jason Fultonauer um, for some uh, guidance and some planning. Uh, Terry Tuttle, Bob Henninger, and a few key players in the wastewater treatment world uh, to join my cause. And, and then we went to uh, Rick and Larry on some of this. So biosolids, bio so let's, let's for a minute just talk about a crappy situation, okay? So biosolids are the nutrient-rich byproduct of the wastewater treatment process, which we can beneficially re, uh, reuse. There are two different type, types of classific classifications for biosolids, class A and class B. Class A biosolids are the highest quality state and federal regulated classification for biosolids. And, and Carrie's on here with me, and she's gonna run through the PowerPoint presentation, I hope. Carrie? Oh, we got sound. Oh, can you hear? Can you can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, if you can screen share. Okay, if I have the right to do that, I will go ahead. I have that right up on my screen right now. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, okay, great. I'm, Going back to Class A biosolids, they're the highest quality state and federal, federal regulated classifications for biosolids. They're free of pathogens. Um, they can be distributed to the public uh, without any issues. They can be beneficially re reused without site restrictions. Basically, a Class B has to be in land injected, has to be thrown into the uh, um, waste facility site like Rod Rodman, if you will, or a Casella uh, waste. Well, uh, waste disposal system. 20 wastewater treatment plants in St. Lawrence that generate biosolids. Larger plants haul their sludge to the bank landfill in Rodman and, or Casella in Franklin County. And I believe the Messina still hauls to Canada. So all of these, all of these materials, we are paying to be disposed of outside of St. Lawrence County. Smaller plants haul to larger plants in municipal treatment systems. Municipalities have to pay for transportation disposal costs and are built into sewer rate. Right now, 
Um, we, <coughs> we handle millions and millions of gallons of wastewater in, in Colvin. We reduce it down to 75,000 gallons. Then ours goes to Watertown Wastewater Treatment Plant. It gets processed there. Then it gets processed into a cake. And then the cake is brought down to a landfill in Rodman. Whereas there's leachant that leaches into the landfill. And then we have to recapture that leachant and put it back at the head of the plant. This eliminates all of those. And high prices of diesel right now um, is going to solve a lot of issues for us. Um, building a centralized biosolid processing facility, drying beds, if you will, could have multiple benefits for the St. Lawrence County uh, residents. Significantly de decrease the cost of St. Lawrence County residents by reducing the price of uh, sewer treatment, result in a soluble product that could be used by farms, SLC residents as fertilizer, and result in a uh, extend the life of the dank Rodman landfill which will reduce tip fees uh, for St. Louis County. And finally, job creation. Um, the next schematic is just how it works. Uh, water comes into a wastewater uh, treatment system. It's divided into two streams once, once it's processed throughout the whole uh, processing plant. The water reclamation facility here is a wastewater treatment plant. They're all, municipal, they're all municipality uh, owned. And then it's split into a high quality effluent that is, has low nutrients, organics, and solid uh, concentration to meet and clean water quality standards. It's polished water. It's really crisp, clean. You don't want to drink it, but it gets injected into our rivers. The second part, the second stream of that, is the new nutrient rich um, organic byproduct. Then it gets either thickened or dewatered, and then the water goes back to the beginning of the plant, then dewatered into a cake storage, that red area. And then what we'd like to see is a regional high heat dryer versus dispose it into the landfills. Um, and Carrie's going to take over the feasibility study. And trust me in the fact that I dragged Carrie uh, kicking and screaming into this and finally had sold her onto this project. And, and Carrie's going to talk about the feasibility study, if you will. Carrie? Okay, thanks, Darren. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. 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 Okay, great. <clears throat> so, as Darren said, um, he asked me to get involved basically because the authority has a lot of experience with wastewater facilities within St. Lawrence County. We actually op contract operate several of those facilities, and we have other relationships with many of the wastewater treatment plants that we don't contract operate, whereby we've provided other services to those uh, municipalities in terms of like assistance with capital projects related to their water wastewater projects and so on. So. Uh, Darren kind of approached me and said, you know, we really think this is a good idea. How do we get this done? And so this next slide that lays out sort of what we would recommend kind of the next step to be, which is undertaking a feasibility study. The feasibility study would basically compile all of the data so that the stakeholders in this project have the information that they need so they can make an informed decision about whether this makes sense to move forward. And if it does move forward, how best to move it forward. So the feasibility study would include a cost analysis that would include capital costs and operation and maintenance ongoing O&M costs, if you will. It would look at the existing costs that municipalities pay uh, for their sludge disposal. As Darren mentioned, how those municipalities are getting rid of their solids right now has a cost. And so in order for those communities to sort of weigh the benefits of looking at, hey, this is a new possibility for us that could save money. How does this compare to what I'm doing right now? They would have that information to be able to show those cost savings. We would look at the revenue from the saleable material, so the compost fertilizer that's generated from the biosolids management facility, how much is that material worth, how much could be generated based on how many plants participate and so on. Um, discussion of potential funding to offset the capital cost, so that would be what grants might be available to offset these capital costs of constructing the facility. And then kind of more on the technical side, it would look at different alternatives for biosolids processing. So there's different ways to do this. Uh, there's some 
model where there could be a component of this where there would be mobile dewatering where you would actually have a mobile dewatering truck or belt filter press or whatever type of technology was selected that could go around to the different treatment plants that don't have this they could dewater the sludge there and then haul the solids material or this could be integrated into the biosolids management facility um, there's pluses and minuses to each of those and costs associated with each of those but this report would evaluate that and make some recommendations. Location for the facility is an important consideration. Centrally locating this in St. Lawrence County so that all of the municipalities could take advantage of this is gonna be important because transportation costs are so high. So this would consider where a facility could be located. As Darren showed you on the prior kind of process flow, there is actually an output from the biosolids management facility that would include um, needing to have a discharge location and a treatment facility. So you're not gonna be building this plant out in the middle of nowhere. You're gonna be needing to locate it within an existing municipality where there's capacity to be able to treat the uh, water that comes off from the process in a permitted wastewater treatment plant. So that's gonna limit to some extent where a facility like this would be able to be located. And then there's different options for ownership and operating models. So this is a facility that could be owned by the county. It could be owned by a municipality. It could be owned by the development authority. It could be owned by a private business. Uh, one of the things that Darren expressed to me, and we also heard from the folks that we met with um, on the county level is there's an important benefit of keeping this public. And that would be making sure that the entity that's operating it has a different mission, which isn't profit. We really wanna make sure that we're maximizing the cost savings that the municipalities are receiving. Then keeping this ownership public like our municipal wastewater treatment plants is important because there won't be that profit margin aspect involved. There's also uh, environmental concerns. I mentioned that there are the water stream that would have to be treated that comes out from this. So there would be some permitting that's required. Uh, if this discharges into an existing wastewater treatment facility, that's relatively minor, but there would have to be an upgrade to the wastewater treatment plant's SPEEDES permit, which is a state pollution discharge elimination system permit. It's basically the, the DEC regulated permit that allows municipality to have a point source discharge into a receiving stream. And then demand for the product, uh, you know, how much product produced and what's the saleable value, but what's the demand for it? Where could the product be used? Who could be using it? Uh, some discussion of that. Approximate cost to complete a study like this is estimated to be between 20 to $30,000. It would also entail get, gathering quite a bit of information from those 20 municipalities that uh, generate biosolids right now and um, gaining support from those municipalities to by resolution to confirm that they want to participate in this project because that will drive the basis of design for the facility depending on how many how many uh, wastewater treatment plants and municipalities participate so what are the next steps well the the first item that needs to be determined is who will be the lead local government agency for this project um, the first step is to have this conversation with St. Lawrence County to see if the county is interested. Uh, if the county is not interested in playing a lead role in this, then uh, as I mentioned before, there are other potential partners or stakeholders that, that could fulfill that role, but we wanted to have this discussion with the county first. Um, once that's determined, then a request for proposal to complete the study could be done. And then you would be able to nail down the cost for the actual study. I'm kind of giving you a ballpark based on other similar work that's been done. And then um, getting the buy-in from the communities as we talked about. A uh, private consultant could do this work or the development authority could do this work with an intermunicipal agreement between the county if the county decides to approach the project that way. And we really tried to respect uh, the time limit. So we're going to turn it over to folks to see if there's any questions. So does Potsdam still actually uh, putting their waste in Adon farms and then actually ejecting? No, no, 
you know, uh, that that eliminated uh, three or four years ago, and that's why we're in a pickle because our our sludge and theirs were combined to Gilbert Farms and land injected. So they closed down the Newman Waste Lagoon, and um, they they bought a screw press. What what did it is they bought it they they bought a screw press um, and they press it. They put it in a cake uh, a cake, and then Casella hauls it to the landfill. What's the reason that this no longer an option? Class B on, on the Gilbert farm. Well, one of the things that Carrie talked about is uh, is the corporate price tag. It kept on going up and up. And, you know, we started at 14 cents a, a gallon um, 10 years ago, and we were up. We're now up to like 23 cents a gallon just for them to haul it as a liquid. So they they went ahead and did a screw press so they could decrease their hauling fees. Um, uh, now they only haul 20 percent. What they used to haul, and they used to haul 86% of their solids before. So, what's, the, what's the dry matter of the sludge? What's that? What's the dry matter of the waste product of the sludge? Uh, ours? Yeah. Uh, ours is about uh, 6 or 7%. So, <coughs> so it's been in water. It's just water. Yeah. But it's super thick water. Yeah. It's pumped. It's pumped as a liquid. So, what type of you're bringing it, you're transporting it in a tanker? Then. Yes. Yep. That we we empty our digester um, twenty four thousand gallons eight thousand gallon tanker at a time times three, and we really wanted to go to pot sand, have them press it, and then send it to. Them. But they're just they're new. They don't want to take in other people's stuff. They want to solve their own problems. So was the cost? I'm still getting around eight on farms. Yeah, with, with Gilbert's farm. Um, would their, they increase their cost to you or, or what? What happened? Now? Oh yeah, they increase their cost to us through Casella. We, I mean, uh, Casella is one throat to choke. So we were we were doing everything through Casella. Okay. Yeah. And there was a little bit of leaching coming from the human waste lagoons that that they were concerned about. Um, they had to repair their human waste lagoons on a couple occasions. But they land spread their cow manure on the on the fields. If you remember a PR incident where some of that leachic went into the waters and they were concerned. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So this is the drying beds are 100 percent pathogen free. They're 100 percent um uh solid pellet. Um it's it's it can be used for, for vegetable gardening, it can be used for uh um, landscapers, it can be used for our number one industry in St. Louis County is agriculture. And we and we're throwing away our best fertilizer. Which is a crime for an agricultural district, if you will. So Fulton, you couldn't actually find another farmer to actually spread that on. Of course, you have to spread it here around. Well, how often do you actually clean your to take the sludge out? Three, three, three times a year that we do it. We're very efficient. We try to keep the hauling as, as low as possible. So we do we fill it up uh, three times, twenty four thousand gallons each time. They're roughly around seventy two to seventy five thousand gallons we eliminate each year. And to buy that much equipment real close to Colton, <coughs> land injection, it, it ends up being a, a smaller two type of operation. That's why we're trying to do a conglomerate of all 20 wastewater treatment plants to, to serve all, all the needs. And you're restricted from putting that into a, a manure lagoon? Yeah, yeah. Because of the pathogens. The air drying system eliminates it from a class B to a class A, which is what everybody wants. So, so if you I have many, one more question. So you're holding a lot of water. It's only 60% dry matter. Yeah. You can't get that that dry matter up as far as trucking. We we're looking into a polymer a polymer trailer now where we polymer it down and we can get it down to 20%, which is still a liquid, if you will. Uh, I'm sorry, 16%, and it's still a liquid. Um, to to dry press it to a cake, um, they it's it's very cost. Uh, prohibitive for our small little system. Um, but even if you do put it into a cake of 20% and you haul it out to Rodman, they still have a leachate from that. And that leachate is being collected from Rodman and put back to the head works of the wastewater treatment plant in Watertown. So the Rodman in turn, of course, not only are we hauling all this cake matter out there, but they're getting leachate from it. And that has to be processed. And all of that cost has to come out of a wastewater treatment plant that is serving your community for all of your water and sewer bills. Your sewer bills are going up. Um, there's two highest costs for all wastewater treatment 
in plants. One is energy, two is biosolids. So the problem I see with, with that low of dry matter in your solution is still your trucking costs. Yeah. And then actually finding, if you're going to have a centralized location that has a wastewater treatment, is the volume of water. If you've got all these municipalities participating, the volume of water, what size that wastewater treatment plant would have to be to take that water? Hence the study. Yep. Uh, I, I honestly think that the, the best model for us and several of the small treatment is to do what um, Potsdam does in a shared services model. I see us, Philadelphia, not even just San Luis County, neighboring, Malone, uh, you name it. If it's closer to Hollett here, um, we, need, we need a truck, we need a, a mobilization unit to go out, dewater, take it, put the water back into the tub or our head works because we can process that water and bring it to a spoke like Canton that has a grass river with a huge discharge. And that, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but, you know, uh, the craft plant closed down here in Canton. And we have a, we have a large capacity of speedies that, and a large capacity of wastewater here at this plant. They could probably facilitate that. It would seem like it'd be more efficient if you could triple your dry matter, you said 18 to 20 percent. Yeah, yeah. Right there, treat your water. Yep. So you don't have to have this huge right. wastewater treatment area where everybody's coming in. I can't imagine the size of it. Right. So if you even had the process of the technology at your place, yep. you would lower your transportation costs, your trucking, yep. plus take care of your water. Those plants cost a lot of money. And if I can if I can co-buy that plant with 10 other small plants. And mobilize it and go from place to place. It's a win win for all of our stuff, and that's part of the study. Yeah. Thank you, Darren. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. First night is next. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, to me, Dank has the expertise in this. You know, they do Augsburg, they are working with Elizabeth now. Everywhere you hear Dank, Dank, Dank. So I, for us to take it on, I, I think a partnership I would be interested in, but I think Dank should be the lead role in anything along those lines. Uh, kind of like we did with fiber optic, maybe partner up and do something along that line. Um, how big a facility are we talking? How many acres would this be? How, how large? Do you think? That really depends on the study. We've talked about anywhere from five to seven acres as, as a possible. And there's there's components of this too that depending on where the study is, on what's efficiency, because we want to see sustainability, um, O and M. And um, the, the sustainability is this plant just doesn't just do O&M for the next plant after this one, how does it cycle? And I'm, and I'm more than a, I, I could catch my bet that when you charge for the incoming coming in and charge for the outgoing going out, you'll see that this model is so self-sustaining that it'll, it'll pay for itself both ways. So the, the thing I think, and Canton, always, whenever you talk centralized, Canton always comes up, you know, yeah. and without doubt it is. But I'm thinking Lisbon. Lisbon has the transfer site. We have quite a quite a project going on there. And Augsburg just built, or is building their, their major wastewater treatment facility and the outgrowth of go to the river, if that's where it's supposed to go. And we bypass the grass river when it's low and whatever, but just my thought. But you know, it's a little bit further, but and I think right there. I think exploring those sites too is part of the study. I, I'm not opposed to Lisbon. No, I, I, I get it. Yeah, right. <coughs> Lisbon's yeah. a lot closer than Watertown for me. But back to the original, I think Dan should be the lead agency. And if, if there's an interested board, I support this small half. Yeah. You've said pathogen free a few times. And my question is. What do you do to make it pathogen free? Is it the air drying or do you do something else that makes it pathogen free? No, the air drying, it, it, it's a certain temperature that kills every single pathogen in it and it makes it completely safe, 100%. So that class A uh, fertilizer is all done on a superheated um, air, air bed drying system. Yeah. Round the list. This is Haggard who's next. Thank you, Ms. Um, Madam Chair. I'm from Potsdam. I called Greg Thompson when this first came up. I'm sure yep. you know him. And he told me about the process they use. And now I'm finding out that that goes to a landfill. If they kept doing that process, would there 
whatever cake or whatever it is, and I don't fully understand. Yep. That. Would that be able to be incorporated into the new? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Plasium is now, I mean, hypothetically going to listen. Right. Which is a lot closer than paying tipping fees at, at Rodman or hauling from Patsy Molly and Water. Okay. Yes, so that, that fee would, that, that cake would come centralized here in Salem's County. And then be a part of this re recycle. Yes. Process, right? Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You bet. Mr. Rager Smith. Uh, this is directed toward Carrie. Uh, Jim Rager from my office. Uh, Carrie, would uh, Dad be willing to uh, operate this? Yeah, I think, Jim, that's definitely one of the alternatives that would be on the table for discussion. I think it could make sense because of the expertise that we have in the licensed operators. That would be something that could be looked at as one of the alternatives of the study. Now, uh, the uh, as part of the uh, American Rescue Act, we've allocate funds to the uh, St. Lawrence County, County IDA for economic development uh, purposes. And uh, when our, you know, if it's the pledge of the board, uh, when our committee uh, meets with the IDA, um, or with Patrick Kelly, uh, we could encourage them to fund this study uh, Using those funds, and uh, and then you would have a much better uh, basis for a discussion. Uh, but I'm like Dave; I strongly believe that uh, an agency like Dave that has a great deal of experience in uh, uh, wastewater treatment and operating wastewater treatment plants and has relationships with quite a few of the wastewater treatment facilities in the county and uh, knows about their um, strengths and limitations um, would be in a much stronger position to uh, ramrod something like this and own something like this and um, you know, make it successful and uh, keep it out of the uh, political sphere and uh, get the job done. Mr. Sheridan, do you want to ask? Yes. Uh, in communities where this sort of uh, plan is underway, are there any uh, drawbacks? Are there are there communities that, that see negative effects in their community because of maybe, in other words, the question would be, is there an odor to any of this uh, the, in the air? Almost all the plants come anaerobic, or excuse me, aerobic, which we, if you go into a wastewater treatment plant, you smell earthiness, mm -hmm. and that's what you smell. Um, when these, when, when this hits the plant, it, it comes in not as a stagnant, septic smell, it comes in as aerobic usually. Um, which is an earthy smell, and the plant maintains that by heating it up and and uh, and air drying it before it's an odor issue at all. Yeah. So there is no odor issues, uh, <laughs> such as like maybe uh, liquid manure in some areas. Uh, I, nothing I, similar. I'm doubting that Aiken's farm in Hopkins is 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 a lot more than this would ever be. So no, I don't think there would be that odor issue at all. No, but that would be part of our. Fact finding with the air bed drying system. So, yeah. Where else, uh, if you know, are there like facilities that are up and operating uh, at this time? I, I was just talking to Ruth about um, the fact that there's one in Sullivan coming up, and then Sullivan's building up one now. Um, what's the one that Bob worked at, Gary? Endicott. Endicott, um, uh, Kessler Association, as we learned this, um, is developing one close to Jamestown, uh, another, there's two out west, next to Buffalo and Jamestown, on the, on the south and west, uh, um, the southwest and the western part of the state. There's three or four being built right now, currently. 
Okay. This year. So they're up yeah. and they're being built, but they're not up and running. There's like Endicott's been up and running for several years. So yeah. looking at Endicott, can you uh, extrapolate uh, what uh, Northern New York, this area would need as far as personnel to run such an operation? I, we can't at this point, just because we need to find GPM uh, or GPD gallons per day that the sludge handles. And that depends on how large this, then we size the plant based on that. And then we do an O&M cost on that. Um, so, you know, roughly anywhere so, from five to 11 jobs. Okay. So as far as Endicott is concerned, how many people do they have working for them? And how many gallons are they uh, uh, you know, treating? Uh, I, I don't know if Bob Henninger or Carrie can answer, answer that. Carrie, do you, do you know what we're talking about? I don't, but there's so many factors that play into this in terms of like the discussion about mobile dewatering that would be slightly different. St. Lawrence County is huge. And so this is really this is really different because we're looking at a centralized plant that's going to be receiving wastewater from a lot of local governments. So as you guys know well with solid waste, you know, your transportation costs are not like Jefferson County's or Lewis County because you're so far away and you're so spread out. So the study is really important to nail down those numbers because taking information for a more metropolitan area and trying to extrapolate it for St. Lawrence County, I don't think is going to be a good um, basis for comparison. I think you, you really have to go through the work to nail down which municipalities want to participate. Then you've got the data to understand what's going to be coming into the plant in terms of the flows and the loading. Then you can size the equipment. If you co-locate this with an existing larger wastewater treatment plant, there's a lot of economies of scale there. There may be sharing of personnel that could occur where personnel that operate the wastewater treatment plant could also maybe share in the operation of this facility, which is really just an added step in the treatment process. So those are the kinds of details that have got to be worked out through that feasibility study, I think, to really get good answers and determine whether you know, whether what's the total cost analysis and what's the cost savings for the communities at the end of the day. Is there, thank you. Is there any estimate of what it would cost to do that survey? What would you be looking for? Yeah, that was the 20 to $30,000 that I had included in the presentation. That's my estimate to complete that feasibility study. Thank you, Karen. Very, very much wrapped it up. Uh, you know, a lot of good questions, uh, but uh, questions that aren't going to be the answers to until we do the, uh, we got to do the feasibility study. Is there a feeling on other people want to vote now on April? So, certainly, there's funds in the ARPA monies that can be utilized for the study. I think that, as Richard says, we detail the you know, possibility plan and definitely a cost. Do I think it'd be money well spent? It'd be to determine whose wastewater facility could actually handle such a venture. Probably the number one driving place about where it would be. Certainly Canton or Robinsburg, probably the largest. If you look at the five major towns, Governor would be a little ways away. Uh, the little towns go probably gonna have some expense trucking is whether they want to participate in Southern end of the county, which you represent, Mr. Janisha. Maybe they just want to, maybe they're taking their stuff to Robin now. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, actually one of the towns uh, that I represent, they're uh, currently hauling the sludge to Watertown. Uh, you know, so there's a, <clears throat> anyway, there may be some of the smaller, some of the smaller towns. Uh, may not see a lot of benefit to this but when i uh i actually shared uh i shared the presentation uh with one of the supervisors uh, in my district uh and told him i said you might want to see this give you a little preview and uh get on youtube this evening uh, because it's going to be a presentation uh and uh he called me back he was, he was excited he said there's there's a huge uh, potential for saving money and uh, so I think it does. I think something like this, if we're, if we're successful, 
No, it can do two things. It can save our municipalities money. And uh, we know that the, uh, the landfill, there's a finite amount of land there. You know, and we keep dumping stuff in there that we could process and use somewhere else. I think that's a that's a good uh, good way to manage our resources. You know, I think it's certainly worth looking at. There may not be, you know, there's uh, 22 plants in San Jose County. 17 of them are small ones. Uh, Mr. Uh, I would like to move that we uh, ask the IDA to uh, use the ARPA money to uh, fund the study and. Uh, and uh, have planning office report back to us on the findings. Second. You have a resolution point of order. You have a resolution, a motion on the table. Okay. Any discussion on this? Is your second? You first. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we want to use the IDA to do this and take it from somebody else or the three million that we have for our own uh, infrastructure for water sewer. I, I think that's where the money should come from. That's what it is, right? Oh, it is the same thing. Okay. Same All right. My mistake. Um, but I'm not normally for studies, uh, but this just seems like it's going to solve a lot of issues, going to save some money. And I'd like to thank Darren and Terry and Jason for all the hard work and ingenuity because I think this can save the taxpayers some money. Thank you. I, I did want to interject a um, couple of things with this. One, I don't think that this study could come fast enough because right now we're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars um, every every year. Um, I think it, I think you're looking at a loss, a revenue loss. At least a half million dollars leaving St. Louis County every year to throw a thing, uh, about valuable product that we can use back here at St. Louis County. The other thing I want to mention is there's a lot of grant and grant and grant. This is the this is the era of grants, as everyone knows, this infrastructure is coming and solid waste materials grant, um, USDA grant, because it's a it is a fertilizer, and um, a shared service grant. So you're gonna get a shared service grant. A solid waste grant, a USDA grant. Uh, this is a slam dunk, dunk, and all three of them would beg to, to be on board with this project. So you're looking at a grant and grant and grant. And then and there's a sustainability uh, for the bond for the rest that would cost the county a pay. Question for Kerry. Kerry, uh, as you know, Hubleton has a uh, treatment plant that's going to be uh, hooked up pipeline wise to the city. Uh, of Ogdensburg. Could a place like Hubleton be a collection point for other municipalities uh, and use that no. pipeline? No, you really need the solids and depending on how, what form that comes in, as Darren said, it can vary significantly. It can be as low as like one or 2% solids or it can be as high as 15, 16, 20% solids. That material needs to go be processed in a different way, depending on what that solids concentration is. And you don't want to put it into a pipeline. You need to feed it into the head of the biosolids treatment plant. Depending on the solids content drives how much additional treatment it would require, but it's got to go into that biosolids treatment plant. Thank you. Just, just by the way, Ogdensburg does, does generate biosolids and those get hauled to Chateauguay right now through a private contract. So even though Hubleton is generating, you know, their wastewater is going to Ogdensburg, Ogdensburg is now really, once Hubleton gets connected, they will just be collecting more because they have Hubleton's biosolids as part of their, you know, normal wastewater stream once Hubleton is connected to that system. Good, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I wish ours could run on this stuff that could be producing. I think that'd be a perfect solution, which leads me to my question. Is this the most ecologically sound? You betcha. Okay, that's very important. It's, it's uh, I have three, three of my children that are all into environmental science. Yeah. 
and there, there is uh, ones in the field and two are in college for it. And their the professors think that this is this is it. This is the this is, and if you want to talk about ARPA grant, it hits the infrastructure, it hits the water, it hits the wastewater, it hits the environmental. I think there's one of the five limits tests that you hit in broadband. You're hitting four out of the five on an ARPA study for this. It actually really satisfies your ARPA grant through the environmental and infrastructure section. Great. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. We had a resolution. Sorry. And a second. Does anybody want to discuss? Just one more question. When we turn this over to Dank, uh, who makes the decision in terms of location? Would that be Dank's decision? Yours. The San Luis County Legislature. Yeah. With the recommendation. Right. Dank's going to give you recommendations and feasibility. Yeah. I, I would think that would depend on. What direction we choose to take? Uh, you know, I I think if the county owns the plant, then certainly the county chooses where it's going to locate. I would advocate that we let we do the study. Day gets to look at the results of the study. You know, since they feel that this is a really good. Uh, project and uh, one that is uh, fundable, then they go ahead with it. They choose the site, they build it, they operate it, and we uh, wish them the best. Uh, that kind of leaves out the community, I, and I'm a little concerned if, over it. Go ahead. If I could just weigh in, weigh in here, what I would recommend, we, we've done a lot of shared services projects. I mean, more than I can count. And part of the reason why those projects are successful is because we have a stakeholder group that's involved in making the decisions as the project moves forward. I would envision this process taking that same model approach where we have key stakeholders that would include county representatives, development authority representatives, potentially uh, municipal representatives from the sites that are being considered that sort there's going to be some go no go criteria for the for a potential site for example they have to have a existing wastewater treatment plant that's going to be large enough and has capacity and they've got to have land that can be built on to expand so there's going to be certain locations that are going to be preferable and that it isn't to say that those are the only locations, but they're certainly going to be the best, uh, most feasible locations. So having representation from those key communities that may be part of the decision-making process is also important because if they don't want to do this in their community, then you know that's sort of going to drive the train. If they're not open to this or wanting to partner, then that you know, may not be a good option. So, but kind of back to the approach, I, I don't think it's the development authority. It's not just the county. I think this would be a partnership where we are working collaboratively together to get all the information, see what the costs are, see what the cost benefit is. And then we can make some decisions about ownership and how things progress and site location is certainly part of all of that. Mr. Forsyth. Thank you. Um, should we put thirty thousand limit it for thirty thousand? Are you comfortable that thirty thousand will do it? And should we word the resolution to include up to thirty thousand? Or what's your thoughts on that? What's that? So it comes out more. Whatever. I just think we should have a number. I, I think we let Jay and the IDA work work that out. <laughs> Is direct that this is a priority and we want to see this done. So I will make the amendment that the limit to the study for St. Lawrence counties uh, will be thirty thousand dollars. Second. Second by Mr. Gray. I'll second. So discussion by Mr. Lane. Now, would we need to have an RFP for that? Gary? 
You, you don't. We can do it as a shared services agreement between the county and the development authority if that's the way you choose to proceed. Okay. Are there any other options to that? Yeah, yeah. You could absolutely have do an RFP and hire a private consultant to do this study. Okay. Thank you. And if I may answer that question, um, on Carrie's last last uh, slide, um, second to last slide, on um, the options private consultant or a team of licensed water operators, um, she holds seven wastewater treatment plants in Dank. Um, I'm looking for a uh, a small municipality that's bleeding um, money on biosolids. I'm looking for this to be fast track and going with a private consultant. They have to start from page one where they're ahead of the game when it comes to being into uh, every wastewater treatment plant in St. Louis County knows Terry Tyler has a good rapport with it. My vote, um, my suggestion to you folks is, is um, Dan would be the one to do the study in my Well, the only thing I can say is that we've worked with Dank over the years, and uh, I'm certainly aware of several townships, two of which I represent, that have worked with Dank and still do. And uh, I've never heard a bad word about uh, you know Dank's uh, commitment to serving them and uh, the way they do it. And uh, if there are issues, they take care of them. So, and uh, I know Kerry personally, uh, and I am very uh, in tune with what her qualifications are. Uh, they're beyond reproach. And uh, I think that uh, Dank would uh, you know, do the job. I also think it's our duty to find out if there are other available roadways to accomplish this. And that was the reason for the question. Yeah. Great, great questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have a resolution that's been seconded with the $30,000 limit to get Dang to look at this. Does anybody else want to discuss that? Okay, no, seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? That's on the amendment. Present. 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 I'm leaving our PowerPoint presentations for anybody that wants a couple. Uh, I also want to mention the Association of Towns just covered a webinar on biosolids uh, just this past Wednesday, and they said that this is the solution. And so when this webinar becomes available to the county, I, I recommend you you know, looking at that because it's, it's the Association of Towns actually endorses this, this process too. Thank you very much for your time with me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. I have a resolution authorizing the chair to sign a contract with Dell Financial Services to provide replacement virtual server and backup equipment and software for St. Lawrence County. Move by. The MPX is seconded by Gary Smithers. And in some place, we have Rick Johnson. There we go. Let's talk about it. Good evening. Right Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, so this resolution is to, um, so we've got an infrastructure that supports uh, all of the county servers. We create them in what are called virtual servers. So it's, it's uh, uh, all of the servers that we have in the county are built in this environment. Um, it now is aged. It's running out of space. Our, um, our needs continue to grow. So both from a supportability standpoint and growth standpoint, I we did some looking around at some options and came up with what I feel is a very positive and cost efficient way of going forward uh, where I take my current budget and it's actually gonna end up, uh, if you choose to, to go in the direction of the multi-year payments. Um, my current budget of cost to support both the server environment and the backup infrastructure. So it's everything that backs all that stuff up. 
uh, is over $50,000 a year. This contract with Dell Financial Services will replace the entire infrastructure um, with new and better and faster stuff. It will back things up more efficiently. It will put us in a position to be able to recover much more quickly. We had, um, as you may remember earlier in the year, a bit of a bump in the road uh, with, we, we got everything back, but it took much longer than, than I wanted it to take than it should take. So this puts us in a much better position to, in all of that regard, uh, for less of a cost than what we're paying now. Happy to entertain questions. Questions? Mr. Perkins. Uh, what, what's the uh, difference between a virtual server and a physical server? Once upon a time, that's a great question, Legislator Perkins. Uh, once upon a time, every time we wanted a new server, uh, I mean, honestly, just <laughs> picture it like a PC except bigger. Uh, and I've got uh, racks still in my data center that, um, that housed these servers. So for every, uh, for every server that we added, there was, uh, there was a, a, a new physical box of varying sizes, depending on how, how big a server that it was. With the advent of virtual server technology, um, basically, uh, it, it's the same basic kind of stuff. Like if you came down to my computer room and looked, you'd see three servers. You would see a couple of network switches, which is basically the stuff that connects everything all together. And you'd see a pile of storage, uh, which is where, you know, everything, you know, all the files get stored. Um, but using technology, basically, we are able to very efficiently carve out uh, uh, servers from that. So it, it's basically a huge drawing board and we can, uh, I mean, it's finite resources, but we can make, um, uh, I'll probably be able to make half as many. We, we have about 50 servers top to bottom in our environment now. Um, and this will enable us to, to probably create half again as many should we need to. What we find is there, there are certain servers like our file servers and the servers that, um, that, that serve the Munis program, our email that are fairly stagnant. They're there, they're always there. They grow and get bigger because there's more stuff on them. Then there are other things that are more behind the scenes um, a, a new vendor, so, so Jay and community services is onboarding uh, a new system, so he may need a server for that. Uh, and we've already got the infrastructure in place to, to do things like that. Does that answer your question? Sure, yeah. close enough. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, this passes. Next up, we have a resolution authorizing the chair to sign a contract with ABS Solutions LLC to provide professional services for the installation of the virtual server and backup infrastructure for St. Louis County and modifying the 2022 budget for the Information Technology Department moved by Mr. Smithers, seconded by Mr. Perkins. Where to head? I, there's the rub, right? Uh, this is the installation cost for said virtual server infrastructure. I, uh, this is a trusted partner and that we have worked with and have a great relationship with. What I asked them to do, because I have professional staff here, uh, we, we help out with things like this too. So, uh, but I asked them to basically price the white glove service, uh, which is what you see before you, the $37,125. The strong likelihood is that it will not run 
that much. Uh, were it to, so I have, um, I have enough in my budget to cover 10,000 of that. And I am asking uh, for appropriations to cover the remaining 27,000 or however much of that I uh, should end up needing. Because I didn't, uh, simply because I uh, can't comfortably cover that. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, for the Sheriff's Department. I have a resolution setting business hours for the St. Lawrence County Sheriff's Office Legal Commission, moved by Mr. Smithers, seconded by Mr. Ford. Go ahead, Hi. Good. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this resolution is uh, for us to obtain accreditation through the New York State Sheriff's Association. Uh, if some of you remember, we had obtained accreditation through the criminal division through DCJS in 2020. Uh, as we worked through our policies, we came across uh, language that requires us to ensure that our uh, office hours are posted for the civil office and that's why this resolution is before you tonight. It's gonna to run, uh, coincide with regular county business hours, eight to four, um, but it needs to be approved by this board so we can obtain the accreditation. We have plan on applying for that uh, no later than June 30th, and then it'll take several months uh, when the Sheriff's Association can come up here and perform the accreditation evaluation. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Next up, we have a motion authorized to share fiscal resource deputy position and modify the school resource deputy program moved by Mr. Kenesha, seconded by Mr. Akers. All right, this resolution, uh, this resolution uh, was graciously, uh, the possession was graciously approved by this board. Uh, I can tell you that this program has been a success uh, and we started at Edwards Knox Central School on April 1st uh, with an intermittent schedule uh, through the remainder of the school year. Uh, this would authorize us to increase appropriations, uh, setting up the accounts for this uh, particular position and also increase our revenue by $79,069. This officer that's assigned is in the middle of the pay scale. So there may be some questions as to, uh, you know, why it, the, the amount is what it is, but based on fringe rates uh, and where this deputy is located in the pay scale, that's where the number comes from. And I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns. Any questions? Yeah. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None, motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have the Vacancy Review Committee with Mr. Yeah, so Sean will be going very far. He's the uh, reporting on the only department that's in front of you tonight. Uh, we had seven departments considered at the Vacancy Review Committee meeting this month. Uh, that is, as I said, the Sheriff's Office tonight. One other info item that will bring to your attention. Uh, but then also we'll have three departments on services and three more on finance. Um, so we are looking, uh, as I like to keep you updated, we're looking right now at approximately 80 positions vacant in the county. That includes our temporary positions. Uh, we are currently running at uh, a 90% uh, immediate fill rate uh, and about a 6% held uh, for 30 days. So I think there really has not been hesitation on the board's part um, to provide authorization for positions that are budgeted to be filled. We've also seen, I think, um, a continued number of new positions um, that we'll also continue to see this month as create and fills. I think we've taken some opportunities in temporary positions. Those, I think, are working themselves either into positions that are going away or coming back before you as permanent needs to be addressed. Um, so with that being said, we have a um, sheriff, uh, sheriff here tonight to present on the sheriff's vacancies. Um, and the first one is um, the corporal position at the correctional facility. Sean? Yes. So, uh... 
we just recently had a promotion. There was a, a retirement to a sergeant. The person that was promoted to sergeant was a corporal. So this would allow us to fill that corporal position, essentially a backfill. Questions on the corporal position. Okay. Um, then the two remaining are correction officer positions. Sean, whether you want to speak to them separately or together, it's up to you. I, I think together is fine. Well, one is a backfilling of that uh, vacated sergeant's position, as we all know how the chain of events uh, goes through. Um, and then the other one was a resignation uh, of a correction officer, and we're looking to uh, replace that person with full time to meet our uh, commission standard of 56 officers plus the two administration. Questions on the correction officer? Um, um, how is the staff or the uh, occupant of the jail? Is it high, low, same? I know statewide it's way down, red made how, how's our facility? Uh, I can tell you that our uh, pop count uh, today is at 104. Um, our females are, we are two away from uh, maximum capacity. Um, we do have uh, some plans in place in the event that we do reach max capacity. Um, but uh, we're at 104. Uh, you know, we're quite a ways uh, to, to fill up in the male population, but uh, certainly watching the female population. Um, we do not have any COVID in there. And uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Any other questions on these? Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And we have the county administrative items uh, to update you on this evening. I uh, wanted to remind you that the uh, extension on the mobility attendance. Uh, we'll conclude on the 15th of May. Um, also, uh, the, we are continuing to report on the Monday and Thursday cadence at this time. So I'll keep you updated on what that is planned to change, but at this time we'll continue with that uh, repetition to our reporting. Um, it allows on Mondays for the weekend uh, data to be captured, um, and we are still in a high community, uh, community level categorization. Um, last Wednesday, Chair Sheridan, Legislator Akers, Treasurer Cole, and Assistant Administrator Sofer and I traveled to Albany. We were able to hand deliver the agendas, uh, the legislative agendas that were adopted, as well as copies of the ARPA resolution that was adopted at the board meeting, the City of Augensburg resolution, and all of the resolutions requesting state action. Um, so we were able to, it was a little bit unique, we were able to sit down with all of our assembly representatives at the same time, and then we moved over to meet with all of our senators uh, simultaneously. So it was really a great opportunity. Uh, we were then welcomed uh, by Assemblyman Smullen to the assembly floor. We were introduced as a delegation from St. Louis County, and we were able to watch a few of the floor votes. So that was also another unique opportunity um, extended to us. So it was a good visit. Um, and we're happy to, to bring the issues important to St. Louis County um, to all of you. Um, tomorrow morning, the North Umberland Bridge, I believe it's the last two beams, are being removed as a part of the Reggie project. Uh, you'll recall that this one that was approved, and they are continuing forward with that project. Um, I believe they'll also be legislators for the district, Legislator Lightfoot, and Chairman Sheridan will be in attendance as well. Um, tomorrow, with two other, other officials, I will be touring the Riverview Correctional Facility in the afternoon. <clears throat> and then on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, with the help of the organization of the St. Louis County Youth Bureau, uh, we'll host the first of hopefully many tours uh, with two first grade classes, one on each day from Banford Elementary School in the Kansas School District. So we're happy to um, hopefully re-engage um, the younger group and uh, re-engage the high school group, but engage the younger years um, in their local government. So um, that we're looking forward to as well. And then just a heads up in terms of the board office, uh, later this week, uh, we've got staff both from the board office and the treasurer's office traveling to finance school in Syracuse. Uh, next week, a contingent will be traveling to Indiana for um, UNIS training. Uh, for the next sort of chapter evolution of UNIS. And then um, the end of next week, um, the clerk's uh, legislative board conference uh, takes place as well. And the so, so that you know, uh, we'll be um, out getting some education. I think we're in, continuing to increase our travel with COVID restrictions being reduced. So, looking forward to those opportunities. Any questions? Thank you.
your acres. Ruth, have you been to, able to solidify a date for the ARPA committee to meet with uh, the IDA? I have not yet, but I hope to uh, either tonight or tomorrow. So it looks like this week is kind of shot, right? It looks with all the things going on, or are you planning for this week? Oh, I hope so. Okay. okay. I can reach out to the Next to committee reports, we have agriculture, farmland protection reports, and mm -hmm. Alternatives to the incarceration board, Mr. Burke. Okay. Board of Trustees for Supreme Court Library, Ms. Kent. Okay, do a report, please. Okay, so emergency medical services advisory board has not met again since the last time I reported. That brings us to the Environmental Management Council. Can you hear you, Mr. Miller? Thank you, Madam Chairman. My report will be very short tonight. Um, the last meeting was on April 20th during the spring break week, and I was traveling late to Virginia Beach with my family. Uh, but a couple of just uh, announcements. Um, the, the Household Hazardous Waste uh, event is occurring on May 21st at the Human Services Complex from 9 to 1. Um, that'll be the May event, and then there'll still be another event in September. And um, there is currently ongoing discussion about the stance that the EMC has on nuclear energy. Um, so I will have a full report. Uh, they're working through those details at the subcommittee meeting next week, and we will have a final um, EMC board statement on nuclear energy at that point. Our next meeting is on the 19th. Next up, we have fire advisory board on participation. Madam Chair, uh, Fire Advisory Board met on uh, Thursday, April 19th. And uh, we had a, a combination of, of in person and Zoom. Uh, with some discussion regarding the uh, state of the, uh, of the emergency radio upgrade and the uh, and, uh, some discussion on the dispatch center construction projects. There's also a question regarding workers' comp coverage in regards to uh, mutual aid events. Uh, that was a question that was turned over to uh, uh, County Loss Manager, Loss Prevention Manager, and County Attorney, and they uh, certified the question. Uh, next meeting is uh, June 16th, 2021. But I do have uh, I do have just something I'd like to share with the board. And it was uh, in regards to uh, firefighter, volunteer firefighter scholarship bill. It was a, uh, it was a, it was a volunteer firefighter scholarship bill that was introduced um, in the assembly in uh we read just just some of it to you uh, the report just days after volunteer fire departments across new york state called their recruit new york campaign effort to generate interest and boost the ranks of emergency personnel assembly democrats rejected a bill aimed at aimed at increasing the number of volunteer firefighters in Berkeley County. Uh, number of, I'm just going to pick a couple of things. Number of volunteer firefighters in New York State has been in steep decline for several years. Uh, the proposed legislation would have created a, a scholarship for those who become volunteer firefighters. Uh, maximum scholarship award would have been uh, uh, approximately $28,000 over four years. Uh, to be eligible, a person would be required to serve as an active volunteer firefighter for eight years and attend 25% of emergency calls each year, agree to reside in New York State, and annually submit an affidavit uh, verifying participation in 25% of emergency calls. Uh, I think the thing that's just noteworthy here is more than 96% of registered fire departments in New York are either partially or fully volunteer. Uh, 2020 report by the National Volunteer Fire Council stated that two thirds of fire departments have trouble with fire, fire retention. A uh, recent news report estimates the number of volunteer firefighters in EMS in New York State dropped from 120,000 to 80,000 in the last 20 years. I think the thing that I find the most troubling about this is that we have had a concerted effort uh, to try to identify and get more folks in the EMS and volunteer fire service, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can provide free tuition for folks that are incarcerated. Uh, we can do all sorts of stuff like that. 
but to get our volunteers uh, that we need to help uh, protect the population uh, because it's not as important. Mm -hmm. Uh, Inter County Legislative Committee was held at the golf course in Malone. Um, they basically kind of went over part of what they talked about at night. That they did have a uh, discussion of the Adirondack Harvest Program, which is kind of what we do here, where everybody goes around to the apple orchard. Um, and they read the Inter County Association. Uh, resolutions that they took to NYSEX there. And on the 26th of May, we'll be going to Saratoga. Jury board, Mr. Chair. Madam Chair, the jury board did not meet. Okay. On to the planning board, Mr. Fay. Our next meeting will be this coming Thursday night. Now, continue report from our April May. Thank you, Mr. Fay. I could add one thing to the fire advisory statistics. The number of interior firefighters has drastically declined. The number of people that don't pass their um, self contained breathing. Yeah, after the COVID, after having COVID. Um, I know we lost in our department a couple of internal guys to that. Yeah, increased lung capacity that can no longer go inside. So we're either going to be fighting a lot of fires strictly from the outside, or we're going to have to get some younger people that are interested in this and EMS because I, I sit and listen to the tones at night and it's like second call for something as simple as a lift. On to old and new business, uh, Mr. Reagan. Excuse me, <laughs> uh, I have a report to give uh, on the uh, city of and the Shade Roller property. Okay, do you want to do that under old and new business? I'll do it whenever you allow it. Uh, old and new business. Do you mind if Mr. Reagan who said his hand up and first? Mr. Reagan, go ahead. The, uh, I, I, I just want to go back to what Larry said uh, about uh, tuition assistance for firefighters. Senator Ritchie uh, has had bills in uh, every year since 2013. Uh, to provide tuition assistance to firefighters, but um, unfortunately, as he pointed, as Mr. Denisha pointed out, um, there's uh, a you know people in the legislature who just don't understand the importance of uh, uh, volunteer fire service uh, and emergency services personnel uh, to New York State. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reagan. I'm Mr. Portman. I'll let Mr. White do it. Okay, Mr. White, you will go first. Excuse me for interrupting, uh, but I thought that you would want to have a committee report <coughs> under committee reports. So, so anyway, uh, the committee or part of it, uh, uh, Legislator Spay and uh, <coughs> myself and Legislator Akers met with uh, uh, Andrea Smith on Thursday. Uh, toward the Shea Roller property. Uh, it's you know, quite an amazing sight uh, at, at ground level uh, and, and looking at it in person. Uh, I took uh, some photographs uh, there and printed uh, some of them off. And I, you know, I don't have enough of them to give to everybody. And uh, we're not printing uh, color materials here. So uh, what I'll do is I'll leave them on the table up here uh, so that after the meeting, you can take a look at them, give you a general idea of what, uh, what you would see if you had been there. Certainly not everything, but uh, I think a, a pretty good representation of what the property looks like uh, from ground level. Uh, and, uh, you know, the work that needs to be done in order to uh, bring it uh, to a state that can be marketed. So uh, uh, if uh, Legislator Akers or Faye have anything to say? <coughs> Guess not. Uh, any questions? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corson. 
Uh, two things. Last uh, Wednesday, I had an opportunity to uh, tour the outpost in Lisbon. Our town uh, board is considering building a, a facility almost identical. Uh, it's actually, it's 110. The one in Lisbon that we built is 120 foot by 60. Same, exact same thing. Uh, I'd like to thank Don and two of his staff who met us and gave us a tour. It's a very impressive facility. When we left, uh, you know, they were the, like all in awe. You know, uh, what I what I wonder is if it's possible to get a copy of the plan from the county under shared or however they do it, and maybe a list of material. See if they can pursue it on their own. Um, but it's identical to what they want to build. Almost pound to pound. Um, the other thing is I know we have stopped our timber harvest, and I, I'm a proponent of it. But right now, lumber prices are about as high as they have ever have been. So I don't know what we've got, but I hear maple, walnut, all these different things are through the roof. So if ever you were going to consider it, I mean, now's the time. But I'm also a proponent of not. Everything has its price. <clears throat> Does anyone have new business? Mr. Lightfoot. This morning I attended the uh, weekly supervisors meeting of the Department of Social Services. And one of the topics that uh, was brought up at the very start of the meeting by Mr. Sieber uh, had to do with the news article that appeared in North Country Now. And uh, I don't get the time, so I don't know if it appeared there also. But in regard to Thomas Doyle, uh, a, a supposed psychologist from Rensselaer Falls, uh, and uh, his work with uh, and for St. Lawrence County. Uh, Mr. Sieber went through a pretty good explanation of uh, what he knows about it. And uh, so did uh, the county attorney, uh, who also uh, partook in that meeting. Uh, I've asked the county attorney uh, if he would uh, give us his uh, bent on what has happened uh, and uh, I think an accurate story as opposed to maybe some of the inaccuracies that are in the news article. So if, uh, can I see that he is there? If you would recognize him, as Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Go right ahead, Mr. Madden. Thank you. Uh, as Mr. Lightfoot indicated earlier today, I had managed to have a discussion with Mr. Lightfoot and Mr. Sieber regarding the news reports that I believe you all have probably seen by now regarding Dr. Thomas Doyle. Uh, the news reports stemming from an involvement between um, uh, attorneys uh, John's attorney, Michael Phillips, and attorney Keith Massey of my office on a March 15th proceeding. Uh, late, excuse me, two Fridays ago, I was made aware that there was a problem that arose in the proceeding. The question that had been posed to Dr. Doyle was whether or not he was a psychologist. He testified in that proceeding that he was, in fact, a psychologist my understanding that Mr. Phillips and Mr. Johns um, checked with the New York State um, Office of Professions and determined that he was not a licensed psychologist, but rather a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, it's my understanding that issues arose and challenges to his ability to continue to provide testimony. It's my understanding that the court ultimately determined that he could continue to provide testimony as he was not offered in the proceeding as an expert, but offered as a fact witness. Um, Fast forward uh, to this past week, uh, I received contact from the media indicating that they had received a statement from a group uh, known as Child, as well as uh, testimony or transcripts from uh, the proceeding, which prompted me to um, actually continue what I had started earlier in this past week, uh, gathering information associated with our involvement with uh, Dr. Doyle, gathering information related to his background. I will note that uh, the information I have obtained is that approximately 16 years ago, while Mr. Doyle was employed as a psychologist with the St. Lawrence Psychiatric Center, 
Uh, the St. Lawrence County Department of Social Services began utilizing Dr. Doyle to perform evaluations. I haven't been able to confirm that he was providing actual treatment, but he was performing evaluations. Um, it's my understanding those evaluations were to determine what type of treatment course might be appropriate, whether it be uh, to submit to chemical dependency uh, treatment or submit to grief counseling or submit to um, PTSD counseling and the like, parenting assessments, parenting classes. Um, I have uh, been unable to find, at least in the past five years records, where he was providing actual treatment, but rather acting as an evaluative resource. He remained employed with the St. Lawrence Psychiatric Center until approximately 2011 when he retired from the state, at which point he uh, began acting as a family court and Department of Social Services um, uh, mental health counseling um, advisor or consultant. Uh, in reviewing his uh, curriculum vitae, Dr. Uh, Dr. Doyle does have a doctorate, but his doctorate is actually in philosophy. It is not in psychology. He is a licensed mental health counselor. However, his curriculum vitae identifies that he has served in the capacity of psychologist in several locations uh, throughout the state, primarily with the state of New York. Uh, and as I indicated at the time that he became uh, involved with St. Lawrence County, he was acting in the capacity of a psychologist for the St. Lawrence County um, psychi uh, psychiatric Center, St. Lawrence Psychiatric Center. Um, in reviewing the type of work that he performed, as I indicated, uh, I, I described essentially what task he was assigned, um, but I, I haven't really told you where that falls in the procedure. Uh, it's important to understand how this sort of plays into uh, the neglect and abuse proceedings that St. Lawrence County uh, institutes. So, when an individual is alleged to have engaged in neglect and or abuse of a child, a petition is filed alleging the acts that constitute the neglect or the abuse in the family court. After they are filed, uh, the individual will appear for an arraignment on that petition. They can enter a denial or they can enter an admission at that time. As I'm sure you're aware, most uh, will move forward with a denial. The individual has an opportunity to ask for an immediate preliminary hearing, or they can reserve on their right for preliminary hearing to challenge the removal of their children if their children have been removed at that time. The court, as a part of that arraignment, will set down a scheduling order, and that scheduling order will establish when a settlement conference date will be scheduled, and right after that, a fact-finding hearing date. The fact-finding is what you would typically call your trial. That's an opportunity for witnesses to come in and testify regarding the activity uh, that constituted the neglect and abuse. Following the determination on the neglect and abuse, if the court finds that neglect and abuse exist, they will move into what's known as the dispositional phase. In the dispositional phase, the closest that you could um, sort of make it akin to in a criminal matter would be the sentencing. In the dispositional phase, the court will remedy um, an order or orders that are designed to try to reunify the family as well as remedy the alleged deficiency associated with the neglect or abuse, the facts that gave rise to that situation to begin with. When the court does so, it is not uncommon for the court to indicate that as a part of the disposition, the alleged uh, respondent, having been found to have either neglected or abused the child, must submit to an evaluation, mental health evaluation as directed. This is where Dr. Doyle would essentially come into play. After having been directed to submit to an evaluation, the Department of Social Services would set up an evaluation with one of the evaluators that was available to determine what type of treatment course or protocol would be um, required. From the past five years records that I've been able to see, that's essentially the role that he has played. They have brought him in to do uh, an evaluation to determine what type of further treatment might be necessary. Now, I, in reading the articles, I was actually rather um, uh, interested in some of the observations. One of the observations was um, a, a comment that I saw uh, that suggested, not in the article itself, but relative to the article, that suggested that this must have impacted thousands of people, potentially hundreds of families, um, torn apart as a result of this type of activity. 
well, first, I, I make the point as to what type of role that he was playing in to, to identify that uh, Mr. Doyle or Dr. Doyle's involvement uh, did not uh, seem to come into play until after the individual was found to have neglected and abuse or abused their child. But separately, um, I wanted to find out, you know, what is, was the extent of his involvement with the department? So I asked to pull the last three years worth of records um, so that I could get a sense of the invoicing. You know, who was he involved with? Um, how many cases did he have uh, involvement with? Uh, and talking to the county administrator, the county administrator suggested we do a full review to go back to the point at which um, we could identify the invoicing to him, which would essentially take us back to 2012. As I indicated, we have about 16 years of involvement, but we had records to go back to 2012 very clearly. Um, Ms. Doyle, I don't know if, if you are there in the room, I believe that you are, but I believe you would be able to uh, inform the board as to how much was expended on Dr. Doyle since 2012. So in a review of uh, the appropriation spent on Dr. Doyle, uh, total since actually 2011, we were $3,497 for an average of 800 or an average of $317. Since 2020, we spent $870 total, and the highest spend in any given year was $850. Question. Yeah, Steve, so what are, if I may ask the uh, county administrator a question? Certainly. So what does that indicate to you? Considering what we spent on some of the services provided and the limitation we have on providers, this is not an extraordinary amount. Uh, I think when we look at the consideration of the type of professional that's involved with our services, I think that's the good Mr. Button, you have more? I do. May I? Yes, yeah, please. Thank, thank you. So uh, in analyzing uh, his actual license, licensure, uh, Dr. Doyle is licensed as a licensed mental health counselor and licensed mental health counselors are permitted to engage in evaluation and they can testify with respect to that evaluation that is not outside the scope of their licensure. Um, while uh, it is problematic that an individual would hold themselves out as being a licensed psychologist and not be a psychologist, the question that I have to answer is whether or not the work that he performed was within the scope of the licensure that he had. From the reviews of the files that I've had an opportunity to review at this point, it does not appear that he performed any function on behalf of St. Lawrence County that um, would constitute work outside of that which could be performed by a licensed mental health counselor. But like I said, it, it remains problematic that an individual would hold themselves out as a psychologist and not be one. So with that in mind, this matter has been referred uh, to the St. Lawrence County District Attorney's Office for investigation and review. Um, obviously, the, the county is frustrated uh, and disappointed in uh, the matter and would like to see resolution. Um, can we say at this point that this rises to the level of a criminal matter? I can't. Um, luckily, that's not my role to, to decide that it will be up to the uh, criminal law enforcement uh, prosecutors uh, to determine. Um, but we are obviously frustrated. That being said, I will also note that I am pleasantly surprised at A, the limited amount of involvement that Dr. Doyle has had with our files, as well as the limited amount of activity, which would remain within, at least upon the surface review, um, within the confines of his licensed mental health counselor capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Button? Yes, ma'am. Um, he did testify that he was a licensed psychologist, mm -hmm. as you just said, and that's what, what's been referred. I am aware that he testified that he was a psychologist. I am not sure if he used the word licensed or not, but I am aware that he testified that he was a psychologist. Did they go through the whole thing about him being an expert witness, or was that not 
I, at least as has been relayed to me, it's my understanding from my attorney who was in the room at the time that he was not presented in his capacity as an expert. And um, because he was not presented in his capacity as an expert, there was not a requirement or foundation to be laid as to the expert's credentials. Um, he was actually presented in a fact capacity. However, in the fact capacity, there was a question posed to him as to um, how he is currently employed and in what capacity he's currently employed. And that's where I believe the question associated with the psychologist came up. Thank you, sir. Mr. Burke was next and then Mr. Anders. Steve, how did he sign his evaluation? Uh, what title did he use? And I have a second question as well. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Burke. I, could you please repeat that? I couldn't hear you. I asked how he signed his evaluation. What title did he use? Uh, it was actually a, an interesting thing. He would sign it as Dr. Thomas Doyle and then place his licensure number afterwards. Um, the licensure number didn't identify whether or not it was affiliated with a psychologist um, licensure or with an LMHC licensure. Just Dr. Thomas Doyle and then his licensure. Mr. Burke, I, I apologize, Mr. Burke, I'm having difficulty hearing you. We do competency reviews for employees doing these evaluations. In, in other words, like to practice medicine in the hospital, there's a competency, uh, there's an accreditation committee. Credential. Yeah. That evaluates a person's competency to be able to do certain tasks. Now, assuming that the task that this gentleman was doing providing about mental health evaluations for children in a court system, um, that there would be a, a degree of expertise required for that. Do we do those types of, uh, of evaluations on employees? Uh, Mr. Burke, first of all, he, he is not an employee. We did not hire him in that capacity. As for the credentialing, I know for experts that my office uh, utilizes. We perform the credentialing. However, this was not our expert. And when I say our, I say the St. Lawrence County Attorney's expert. Um, this is an evaluator that has been utilized by the Department of Social Services. So that's probably a better question for the Department of Social Services uh, as to what credentialing process they utilize for their providers. Well, okay. uh, credentials are usually done by people of similar titles, so that if he was proposing that he was a psychologist, there would be a, a committee of psychologists seeing his credentials and basically stating that he is competent to do the task that we're asking him to do. Are you done, so, Mr. Burke? We, yeah, so if we're not doing it, we need to do it. Okay, next, Mr. Aker's had his hand up and then Tony. So, Stephen, uh, I'm glad that um, this person did, in the role that is, he's been playing was never part of the determination that child that children be removed. That actually that action had taken place. My question is: Was his evaluation of the children, or actually the evaluation of parents who the children's uh, who were removed from? Was his, was his position as was posing as a psychiatrist uh, as play a role in actually affecting the judge's decision whether or not that individual can, can return to have care of their children? In I other words, here are the words of Mr. Doyle in responding to a judge or questioning by attorneys on the evaluation of a parent who's had their children removed, did that play a role in actually, because of this supposed expectation of claiming, could it potentially play a role in, in that the inability of that child to be returned to that parent for their care? It, theoretically, it's possible. 
And I'll explain why. As I indicated, he comes up with the evaluation course. If a parent uh, determined that they did not want to comply with the evaluation course, um, the recommendation he would make could actually serve as the basis for a violation to be brought against a non-compliant respondent. Now, that being said, having reviewed what his evaluations were, it was interestingly, um, they were interestingly crafted almost like a bootstrap. So at the conclusion of the, the initial trial, the court would order certain activities, parenting assessment, order that a um, PTSD evaluation go forward, uh, order that mental health treatment be uh, complied with, order that chemical dependency treatment be complied with. When I saw the recommendations that he made, they were, um, I don't know how to put this, they almost were a, a mimicry of the actual order itself. So they did not appear to be inconsistent with what the court had already ordered. I don't know if that was by design or not. Now, I did take a look at the cases he has been involved with in, in the last 12 months since I've been involved in the uh, legal office. Uh, three of those cases were actually abandoned um, the records associated with Mr. Doyle were put in indicating that he had attempted evaluations. The parent hadn't shown up for the evaluation. Um, and that was just for the proof of the parent not having engaged services, not having engaged in evaluations, not having submitted to the court's jurisdiction or the order. Uh, so in those situations, um, yes, his evaluation could be used as a basis to argue that the, the parent um, uh, had been deprived further contact with the child, but it was on the basis that they hadn't shown up for anything. So I'm I'm pretty sure with or without Mr. Doyle's involvement or Dr. Doyle's involvement, it, it wouldn't have made much difference given the fact that on an abandonment, you're alleging that the parent has uh, refused to maintain any meaningful contact with the child for a minimum of six months. With respect to the other seven cases that I've been advised that he was involved with, um, he has testified only to having made an evaluation and recommended treatment. Once again, as far as I know, he is not the individual that is actually providing the treatment. He's not the counselor that sits down and, and reviews with them. Having spoken to some of the other providers as a part of my review, it is my understanding that they provide an individual assessment themselves and perform their treatment based on their own individual assessments, even if they receive the referral. So I'm not sure that his, um, his evaluation would serve as the, the, uh, the key to, to any prosecution on a neglect and abuse or any ultimate finding. That being said, as I indicated, he's been involved in uh, what appears to be 10 cases this past year in testimony, even though uh, his evaluation services did not necessarily arise in the context of this year. Well, that's, that's my concern was whether this individual's testimony was the deciding factor in that these parents or parent uh, did not uh, get their child back in their care. That would be, uh, that's what my concern is. And Mr. Akers, I apologize. I was rather long-winded, but I probably should have said in my review so far, I've seen nothing that would indicate that that was the determining factor. That's probably the abridged version. Thank you. Mr. Um, do, do we have access to a licensed psychologist? Because it would seem that any of the cases that were involved, that Owen was involved with, we owe it to the to, to Owen families to have a licensed psychologist review what was recommended Take a look at the cases themselves. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, as Attorney Button put it, the um, the uh, criminal enforcement or legal enforcement in the county will be looking into this. Or DA, um, I believe that uh, that Mr. Doyle uh, in one of his resumes. Um, described his previous experience before the county um, as an 11 year stint with New York State. Um, is New York State pursuing any uh, criminal um, investigation into um, his credentials uh, at this time? 
That I can't speak to. I do know that the Office of Professions, which oversees licensure, is aware of, of the circumstances uh, as to what they will do with it. Um, those proceedings tend to be confidential, uh, so we may never know what actually uh, comes about from that. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, seeing none, I will just say that when you sign up and you say I'm a teacher, right down to how many courses you take is, is spelled out by the office of professions. You must have this course, this course, this course, this course to call yourself X. And from what I could see of the resume was online today. Um, it would be interesting to see what they thought of him calling himself a licensed psychologist. It's a coursework. So, um, anybody else have anything else? Okay, any other new business? Okay, do we have a need for an executive session? Only for location. Okay, can I have a motion to go into executive session by Mr. Forsyth, seconded by Mr. Lake? 